the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temples shall be howlings in that day, saith Adonai Yahweh. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, and they shall cast them forth with silence. How would you speak this text? Um, this text is written by a prophet, and it was given to him as a dictation from Yahweh, the God of Israel, to Israel, the northern kingdom, because Israel was not one nation state at this time. It had divided between the 10 northern tribes that called themselves just Israel and the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, who just called themselves Judah. Um, and so Amos is speaking to this northern tribe of Israel. And this is just what God says to them. The end is come upon my people of Israel. What an extraordinary thing for God to say about his own people. I don't think that speaks necessarily about a moral issue with God. It really has to do with, man, what did Israel do to warrant their own God disowning them? That's what he says. The end is coming upon my people of Israel, I will not again pass by them. What does that mean? When he says, I will not again pass by them anymore, that basically means, look, Israel, I've been watching what you do. I'm not happy, but I am going to be patient. I sent my guy Amos. This is all the way in chapter 8 of Amos. Amos has been talking quite a while. And so, God has been very patient with the people and he's given them time. You know, when you're a parent, you don't start off your warnings with your children, especially if they don't know any better, in the severest tone, with the severest consequences, with the severest, you know, uh, you know the, the severest response. Immediately, you issue forth the warning so that their conscience can take note and that they have a responsibility and a chance uh, to be able to respond to that warning. You want them to be able to have time to make a response to your warning. Then when you observe, do they abide by that warning or do they go their own way? If they go their own way, you can step it up. And if they continue to go their own way, you can again step it up. And there may be a point, let's say that they are not just a, a child, but they're a teenager, and clearly their moral sense is quite strong. And you as a parent, I mean, if it push comes to shove, you can kick them out of the house. Um, this is what has happened with the people of Israel. <clears throat> the, the basic issue here is that they don't really know God. Yeah, they come to God's temple. Yeah, they come to sing songs to God. Yeah, they come to give offerings to God. But when it comes down to it, what God has required is not motion of the body, motion of the mouth. Even, even emotions, he hasn't commanded those things. What God has commanded is that he is commanded to be perfect as he is perfect. I believe that when God commands that, what he is talking about is you have a certain portion of who you are and what you are. You are to give everything you got all the time with no exceptions. Uh, you, you have a God that doesn't want 10%. He wants everything you are and everything you got and he'll give you everything he's got in return 
but he expects that 100%. And really what this is, is these people are, are worshiping Yahweh like the pagan nations did. They're offering up their offerings, they're singing their songs, but this is a sort of placation so that they can go and do whatever they want. And they think they're gonna get away with it. And so God at this point is basically acknowledging Israel, you got your own idea of what Yahweh is, and that idea is not going to serve you because I'm, I'm not going to pass by the evil that I see anymore, right? Uh, there, there's a, a law enforcement officer. If he sees a crime committed, he has the right to be able to say, hey, I saw what you did there. Please don't do that again. Law enforcement officer has some bit of leeway as far as whether he takes someone to task or not, or even whether he arrests or not. He has some bit of leeway, or she has some bit of leeway. But there comes a point where if a law enforcement officer sees egregious evil being done, you need to put the cuffs on, right? That's, that's the whole point of having a law enforcement officer, is that you see evil being done, you got to do something about it. In verse 4, God talks about what that kind of evil is. He says, you swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be gone so that we can sell corn? Um, when it was uh, the new moon, religious festival, they were not supposed to, uh, to sell, uh, sell in the markets. It was a, a time set apart. It says, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat. Same thing with the Sabbath. Um, and so they are using an unjust measure when people are paying for their food, saying, um, making the epas small and the shekel great. They're, they're not using the right measure. And falsifying balances by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair, pair of shoes. Yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. So they're using a false measure and they're giving the bad portion of the wheat. I presume they're keeping the good portion for themselves. So Yahweh says, Yahweh hath sworn by the excellence of Jacob. I really don't know what he means by that, but it's a very kind of solemn thing. The excellence of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up wholly as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith Adonai, Yahweh, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring up the sackcloth on all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the mourning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. He goes on. The real question I want you to ask is, imagine um, all, well, think for a moment, all of the things that you have seen that you know are not right about churches. Um, now, usually when people talk about that, they say, oh, there's so many problems with the church. But, you know, there's no perfect church. Uh, if, if you ever find it and you join it, uh, you'll, you'll pollute it because you're not perfect, right? So there's no perfect church. That's, I guess, always something that's said. But the question is, if you see an endemic problem in an institution, um, shrugging your shoulders and saying we're not perfect is not an acceptable response. And if that is the response of the institution, I tell you it will not be the response of the CEO of the institution if it's the church of the living God. Because God cannot shrug his shoulders and say, you know, they try their best. That is not how God rolls. God will respond. And I suppose it's a, a, a strange thing, but imagine, you know, that first paragraph I read at the beginning. The end 
is come upon my people of Israel. What an extraordinary judgment. God cannot give a greater judgment in time and space. He can send people to eternal hell, perdition, but the end is come upon my people. In other words, you're my people, Israel. You will not be my people, Israel. That is painful. It would be like if, if America was um, very clearly established by, um, by God and, and America was always getting prophecies from its God, sort of like that, like if America had a national deity and all of a sudden that deity shows up and he says, you know, I've sent all my prophets and you know what, America, you haven't listened and you're just not going to be a people anymore. Wouldn't that be a crazy, painful thing to hear? And God says, uh, verse, verse 8, he doesn't say it's a light thing. He doesn't say, hey, this is uh, something I accept. I want you to accept with, uh, with chipper. I want you to be clapping and joyful and, all right, Lord, thank you. You know, that's not the idea. It's, shall not the land tremble for this and everyone mourn that dwell therein? See, both the effect of the thing and the, pronounce, the pronunciation of that is very dark and very heavy. God acknowledges it's dark. He says this is a manifestation of the day of the Lord, which he says in the previous chapters, is it not darkness and not light? There's nothing cheerful about the visitation of God. In fact, part of the, the, the horrible thing about this is, I will not pass by them anymore. In other words, you know what, Israel, you're my people, but um, I've been staying away. I've been, he's like he's like the husband who leaves home because the wife is sleeping around, and he's just got to get away. You know, he's willing to put things behind him, but you know, he's just got to get away, and you know, he's got to get some some distance. You know, and now he's like, the marriage is over. I'm I'm not putting this behind me. You are not my wife. You are not my people. Why, why is this important? Well, um, I guess for the, the evangelical movement of which I considered myself a part for, for years, um, I would just say, what makes you any different? After all, I mean, yeah, God will never leave or forsake those who are his, but is it a movement that are his? Is it a building or a congregation that he can't leave or forsake? No. No, he can leave a building, he can leave a movement, and he can leave a congregation. It's his individual elect people that he has made that vow to. And for the most part, most of those individual elect people are busy doing the work of the Lord. They don't have time to play religion. Like Mr. Amos here, who is a farmer, and he, he's, from, he's from Judah, he's from the Southern Kingdom. And God interrupts his farm business, and he tells him to go up to the Northern tribes, and he's completely scorned. He has no, no you know, uh, he doesn't have nice clothes, doesn't, doesn't talk the religious talk of the Northern Kingdom, and Amos is, almost chased away if, if God doesn't just plant his feet in the ground. Um, so basically, what, what would stop God from doing the same thing to evangelicalism? You know, the gospel is simply the word of God. So anyone that's born again by that holy eternal gospel can't be lost. Um, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. Um, and Christ is the Word. He is the Word in John 1 and 1 John 1. And um, anyone who's in Christ is a new creature. But in Christ is different than I'm a member of a local congregation or I'm a member of a movement that God has moved in before. And if anything, I would just say evangelicalism what if God walked up to you in the form of a prophet and said, the end has come upon my people, 
evangelicalism. I will not again pass by them anymore. In other words, I see what you do. I see what you're doing with your money, with your bodies, with your time, with your energy. What if he said, look, I, I've been keeping my distance for a while. I have been waiting to see if you'll notice whether I'm present with you. I'm just waiting, 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 separating himself just to see. What will you do? And, and then he says, you know, I'm not going to pass by you anymore. But when he comes, it's not like, oh, Jesus is here. It's he's finding things that he doesn't want to find. You know what I mean? He's the master of the house. He's finding stuff that shouldn't be going on in his house. So he says, um, the, the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day. Howlings as in, oh, God. The sort of cry of desolation, the cry of bitterness, the cry of suffering. And evangelicalism has a very strong market for what is titled worship music. But imagine that God says, I am appointing every worship song on the radio to simply be howling, crying bitterly. God could do that. And I think, honestly, regardless of whether this would be the word for evangelicalism or not. What we should do is what James says, turn your laughter to mourning, your joy into gloom. Um, and verse 8 here, shall not the land tremble for this? What is the land of evangelicalism? Maybe at one time it was the UK. Maybe at one time it was Germany. In some sense with the 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 Lutheran movement of Martin Luther and maybe it was Geneva at one point, but really the land of evangelicalism is probably just the United States. And so shall not the land, the land tremble for this and every one mourn, mourn, tears, mourning, mourning, tears, shall not everyone mourn that dwells therein and it shall rise up holy as a flood it's almost like it's like it's like the flood of noah like there was no no bodies of water then only the people with a divine boat get to make it he says and it shall be cast out and wholly drowned as by the flood of egypt I think he's probably imagining the the seasonal flooding of the Nile River in Egypt, which was um, how they would uh, do their agriculture and do their cash crops of making an empire in Egypt. Um, and he's saying, this is going to come on a timetable and it's going to flood its banks. So regardless of whether you believe things are as bad as Amos says the northern tribe of Israel is. Turn your laughter to mourning, your joy into gloom. Um, don't assume that because you've got a sense of spiritual feels on Sunday morning that God is there, that God is happy. And really, the whole message of Amos is, um, in this previous chapter, he's been warned. Um, he's been warned by one of the, the king's uh, um, staff persons um, in, in uh, Bethel, uh, which was where Jacob had his uh, theophany of the angel going up and down on the ladder which was said to be Christ in, in the Gospel of John. But 
the problem was he was told not to come to Bethel, which means house of God. He says, don't, don't, don't prophesy in Bethel. Go to Judah, eat bread there, prophesy there. Don't prophesy in Bethel. This is the king's uh, chapel. This is the king's court. In other words, we've turned the house of God into an instrument of our own design. I wouldn't want to be those dudes. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want to be the person that's like, um, what are you doing here? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm here for God. Oh, um, you, go, go back to those dudes on the road. Those, those are the people that, uh, that are the God people. But, but the sign on your building says, uh, uh, First Presbyterian of, uh, of, you know, Baton Rouge, you know? Uh, your 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 church says um uh you know uh church of god in christ i thought you guys were about god no no, no go down there go down there we don't want to hear this stuff we don't want to hear about judgment we want to hear god loves us and is going to bless us seek the lord that you may